so much better than when we started the other day. That's because that's what I remember from camp. You know, we get rolling, everybody's all excited, and the other day we started. It was like, <laughs> it's the beginning of camp, not the end of camp. All right, I like what Brother Dave said. Uh, we got some good weather, and we want to take advantage of it. So I am going to try to keep this guy in the right time frame. Say that, so whatever it is. Uh, but uh, so uh, take out, uh, if you're going to take some notes, I think it's a good kind of lesson to take some notes. If you want to, you don't have to. But the title of the lesson is going to, you turn me up. The title of the lesson is going to be um, Rising to the Challenge of Change. Rising to the Challenge of Change. Okay. First thing I want to say is that life itself is change, right? From the time you were born until now, you, you've just been experiencing change. Sometimes as you get older, you kind of fall into this thinking that, yeah, you know, things are really changing through childhood and youth, but, you know, one day I'll get in my 20s and I'll get married and then, you know, life will start to level out. No, as you get older, change and the uh the dramatic nature of it just accelerates yeah yep. now i want to give you young people something to think about you probably have not thought about you know that you're dealing with change but many of the adults in your life parents yeah. teachers they are going through change that's more dramatic than you are and sometimes you go, well, I don't know why they're just all this or that. It could be they're in the middle of dealing with major change themselves, right? And the change doesn't get easier. It gets far more complicated. So we can have parents and even grandparents who are having to make health decisions for their parents. Do they, do they come live with us? Do they go to a retirement center? Your parents are dealing with decisions and your grandparents that are on a whole different level. So don't fall prey to this thing that, oh, well, you know, we kind of deal with change when we're younger and life levels out a little bit. Not the case. We don't necessarily continue to grow, but then you start to age, right? And then that change comes in type thing. Now, there's three types of changes that I want to talk about today. The first one is, change that comes as a result of the decisions that you make. Right. First kind of change. Change that comes as a result of the decisions that you make. I think a great biblical example of this has got to be Lot. Lot is hanging out with Uncle Abraham, God's blessing Abraham, and so as a result, Lot's flocks are growing as well, his herds are growing finally. There's not enough land for all the herds and all the herdsmen. And so Lot's got to start making decisions outside of Father Abraham's bad decision, by the way. Uh, so he decides, he lifts up his eyes, he sees the plains of Sodom, they're well watered, and he says, okay, well, I'll head that direction, and uh, that's where I'll be. When Lot made that decision, I can almost guarantee you he had no concept that that was going to start a series of decisions that would lead him to losing everything he had, including his wife, and ending up in a cave with two pregnant daughters, you know the story. Icky. Okay. So, so the, first, the first thing uh, is change that's a result of decisions we make. Number two, changes that come into our life that are a result of the decisions that other people make. And these are these are ones we're going to talk about a little bit later. They get, they get complicated, obviously. And then the third one is change that comes as a result of what God is doing. Change that comes as a result of what God is doing. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a big earthquake and, you know, it just levels your house. God did that or he allowed it. You know, he didn't necessarily author it. There are some things that God authors, and there are some things God allows. God is not the author of sin. 
but God has allowed the existence of sin in our universe. Because, now listen, because God allows things, he is no less just and no less righteous. Let me, let me simply state this. God never makes bad decisions. God never does anything that is unfair. Right? So that's really important. Now, let me also give you a couple of key points about change. This is separate from the three. Those are the three types of change. But I want to give you some thoughts about change that are really important. And I know we had to jump right into the lesson, but it's because I'm trying to preserve free time. But hang with me, because I, this is... <laughs> it's coming to a neighborhood near you very soon. Okay? <laughs> Do not let people or environments tell you how you're supposed to feel about change. Do not let people or environments tell you about how you're supposed to feel about change. So here's a personal illustration of that. When I was, I think I was around 13 years of age, I came home from school one day and my sister told me, I, I can still remember this, my sister said, mom and dad are getting a divorce. Now we, we were in church, we've been in church pretty much all my life, you know, and I wasn't thinking that direction. And my, my sister says, yeah, you know, mom and dad are probably getting a divorce. And I said, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, all that 13 year old wisdom, you know, I know what's going on in the world. And so, yeah, my, my parents ended up getting a divorce. And I remember thinking uh, I had and I knew other families where their parents had gotten a divorce and, like, the kids were just messed up, you know. And so I'm like, you know, they're angry, bitter, uh, all these things. And, and I'm thinking, man, okay. Uh, I remember not knowing how to feel. So I was at church, and I told, after church on a Sunday night, I told one of my best friends, you know, he's 13 as well, and uh, I'm like, yeah, I guess my parents are, are getting a divorce. Now, he came from a really stable home, really godly home, and his parents, you know, that uh, I think they were together all the way through the end, And uh, but I remember telling him, hey, yeah, my parents are getting a divorce, and he was just like, <laughs> you know, even though it's a thing, and I remember thinking, I told him that because I was kind of wanting to see his reaction to kind of see how I was supposed to feel about it. Yeah. Your peer group's not going to help you sort out how you should feel about change. Okay? Yeah, right. They're just as confused as you are. Yeah. Um, you know, and you just, and here's the thing. Now this may, and I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, and I'm not trying to make light of anything you've been through. I'm telling you how change impacted my life. And the reason I was struggling with it so much is because, here's the reality, I was okay with it. My mom and dad have been fighting for weeks, and I don't know about your house, but some, when there's fighting in the cursor, not my current cursor household, right? Uh, I learned to be quiet and behave my wife. But anyways, uh, <laughs> but in the cursor house where I grew up, you know, some people, some families when they fight they just get mad and get silent and separate that that's not my house <laughs> and we got loud you know and so uh i knew my parents had been fighting and they didn't want to fight but they've been fighting and i was i was cool with divorce so i was like man i don't want my parents to be miserable and if they feel like they're going to be better now i'm 13 or 14 or whatever you know but i'm like if they don't if they don't want to be together then don't be together i was fine with it but i knew other people uh i know teenagers in our own youth ministry that man, they were from the time they were little to the time they got into the youth ministry, they were excited about God, they were excited about spiritual things, and then mom left dad, and they've been bitter yeah. into their mom. adult years. The magnitude, the second thought here, the magnitude or the result of change is not universal. The magnitude of the results of change are not universal. What I mean by that is change affects everyone differently. I, I won't go through it, but I bet you we could go through this room and talk about some divorces that have still hurt people in this room to this day. I'm not saying I'm right and you're wrong. But I'm also not saying you're right and I'm wrong. 
Change affects people differently. That's why you have to know how to ch handle change in your specific life. But one of the things I want to point out is you don't let other people determine how it's impacting you. That's super important. Super important. Well, you know, uh, you know, so and so this happened to them, and they just, you know, now it's happening to me. So I guess I'm freaking out. We, well, you, you may not be the one to freak out. You may just roll on through it like it's no big deal. You have to let God help to sort that out, okay? Uh, yeah, we handle things differently. I am very much for positive influences. One of the things that can help us to handle change is good preaching and, and these types of things. I'm all about positive influences. But I want to be cautious with young people about getting to this place where other people, and it's not just, uh, it's not just how we handle bad change. I remember when I was a teenager, this movie had come out uh, in theaters. It was, it was just, it was a horrible movie. And uh, my friends and I, we were I think 17 or something, we snuck off and, and saw this movie. And it was a double whammy because, you know, uh, where I'm from, going to the movie theater, Ultra Ichabod, and then, and then on top of that, it wasn't Bambi, it was like this really horrible movie. So we all snuck out, we we're all the bad kids and this kind of thing, and we went to see this movie. And we come out afterwards, and uh, we come out afterwards, and we're all just kind of standing there, not knowing how to feel about everything, right? And so one of my friends, kind of feeling, I think personally, the pressure of, was like, <laughs> just a group of teen guys, you know, I love us the Lord, it was like, yeah, that was cool, You're right? And I'm just so Dan that I was like, that was dumb. <laughs> that was so stupid. This was like, we almost got, like we could get in huge trouble for this. And that was lame. What a waste of money. Be careful about just writing off that something's cool just because other people are saying it's cool. Right. Yeah. 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 You may find sin odious. How many of you have ever smelled beer? Right? Yeah, because you're in teen class, right? <laughs> you're like, how is that a correlation? I don't... Yeah. It smells nasty. It tastes worse. Nehemiah told me. <laughs> but if you talk to people who drink, they all say the same thing. Well, it's an acquired taste. Right. Why would I want to acquire a taste that's nasty? But you know why a lot of people, a lot of people yeah. drink? Because right. a bunch of other people drink. Right. Yeah. You're letting other people define and develop who you are. Don't do that. Right. Years ago, like, just shortly after Noah got off the boat, right? Uh, I worked in, in my youth, I worked at Taco Bell. <laughs> I worked at Taco Bell. Boy, lively characters there, let me tell you what. And, uh, I remember this one kid there uh, liked this girl, and uh, <clears throat> one day he's like, hey, check this out, we're kind of on a break, and kind of, because we're you know, breaking, but we were on break. Anyway, <laughs> he pulls out the Zippo lighter, brand new Zippo lighter. He's like, hey, check this out. I'm like, oh, man, that's nice, the Zippo lighter. I'm like, why'd you get this? He's like, <laughs> he proudly declares, I just started smoking. <laughs> proudly declares, I just started smoking. And I'm like, I've never heard anyone brag on that. And I'm like, why? Why did you start smoking? And he was like, oh, I like this girl, and she smokes, and I don't want her to be alone, so I started smoking so we can hang out together. And I'm thinking, what happens when she dumps you and you're addicted to cigarettes? <laughs> Think it through, <laughs> you know? Um, You'd be surprised how many times we're letting other people define right. who we are yeah. and define what we do and define how we feel. You gotta be careful about that, okay? Uh, we don't wanna we don't wanna let that happen. Um, and just because you haven't figured out yet where you're at and how you feel about things is not a reason to go try to search it out from other people because remember everybody's dealing with change, so they're just as confused as you are, right? They're not the source. Now let me ask you a question here. How many of you uh, are planning to go to college? And when I say go to college, I mean move away from your parents 
and go to a separate college where you're going to be living there and everything, would you raise your hand? How many are planning on doing that? Oh, not many. Okay, how many plan? I plan to live with mom and dad uh, forever. And yeah, right. <laughs> Um, now, moving away to college, right, that affects, it's the same thing, but it affects people differently. Yeah. I know some young people who are so, like, shaking scared of the concept of moving away from their family, moving away from their friends to some place they've never been, and they're just so scared. The same change, I know other teenagers who are basically like, dear Lord, let it be today. <laughs> let me get away from these people and start a new life now. It's the same change, but it affects people differently, very differently. Okay, That's important to understand uh, that you can have these different results. And don't ride somebody else's coattails about how they feel. Oh, oh, well, you're excited about this, so I guess I should be excited about this. No, you could be nervous about it while they're excited about it. That's totally okay. Even though life is always changing, and I'm just kind of echoing just a touch from last night. Even though life is always changing, remember, God is never changing. And I'll give you those references from last night, Malachi 3, 6. For I, the Lord God, for I am the Lord I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus the same yesterday and today and forever. Now, God is never changing. The world is always changing. Right. And I want to give you a reference. John 16, 33. Jesus is speaking here. John 16, 33. This is what Jesus said. This isn't, <laughs> this isn't some... Uh, uh, fed up Baptist preacher commentating on society. This is Jesus Christ. And this is what he said in John 16, 33. These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. In the world ye shall have tribulation. He did not say, and you know this, he didn't say you might. Sometimes, you probably will. Jesus said, you shall, this will happen. In the world, you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. When does this truth apply? Does it apply in Jesus' day, in his culture? Does it apply to the lower 48? It applies everywhere, always. In the world, ye shall have tribulation. I'm a little taken back sometimes by the commentary of some pastors who are surprised at the tribulation in the world. Right. I just can't believe what's going on in our society. <laughs> Jesus said this would happen. Right. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be callous, but this isn't the beginning, although there's many people trying to claim it is. This is not the beginning of problems in our society. Right. Many of the apostles who lived, lived in the day of the Caesars. There's a bag of nuts. Yes. They were burning Christians. Right. For their pleasure. Herod found that it pleased the people killing James, so he decided to kill some others. Right. So I'm not saying I'm okay with everything in our society. I'm not saying that. But I'm also not shocked at it. Because Jesus plainly told me, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. I'm going to let that sink in. Some of you, that is a news flash. Thank you that you came and you get that. Recently, I was studying uh, my family tree. I won't go into the whole thing. But on my dad's side, I was having a lot of trouble getting information about, because I had my, my grandfather... I didn't realize that they called him by his middle name and not his first name, so I didn't have his name right. Uh, I thought his I thought his first name was Herbert, but it was Wilbur, and doesn't that just sound like an older name? Anyways, no offense. <laughs> if I've offended any of Herberts or Wilburs, I apologize. <laughs> You're like, are, are those horses or people? <laughs> so finally, I start piecing this thing together, okay? So on my dad's side, I find out that my grandmother had been married three times. 
it was on her third marriage that she had my dad. Now, my dad's dad had been married twice. And the first lady that my dad, and I know it's confusing, so don't worry about it, so I'm, I'm not gonna give you a quiz. My dad's, my, uh, uh, or my, my, uh, my grandmother's, oh, I'm lost, I've lost myself, I'm in my own car. Uh, my dad's first wife, there were my grandfather's first wife had been married three times as well. Her, and I have her, I have her marriage certificate. Her first marriage was at age 18. Her second marriage was at age 19. Her third marriage was at age 26. Now this is early 1900. Now brother Dan, how can this be? There was no internet. There were no cell phones. There was no social media. How could the world have been in tribulation at this time in American history? It was such a wonderful time outside of slavery, the depression, a couple of world wars, but other than that. So apparently technology's not a problem. It's a result. It's just being used by sin, right? And again, listen to me, be cautious here. I'm not saying in any way, shape or form, you go to my house right now, sitting on my porch, waving in the wind and absorbing the rain, <laughs> is an American flag. You walk into my shop, there's a large one hanging there, okay? I'm not saying don't care about your country. I am not saying that. I don't promote apathy. I don't promote that. We are, we live in a great country where our voice actually counts in politics. So let's, in God-honoring fashion, raise our voice. But let's also not act like we never knew this was coming. Right? If you believe politicians are going to save our country, I challenge you to go revisit the scriptures. Now, does that mean that I don't vote and I don't know? I never said any of that. But my hope and my faith to have peace comes from Jesus Christ. Because he said, hey, be of good cheer, young people. I've overcome the world. I've overcome the world. And in me, you'll have peace. Why? Because though the world constantly changes, hey, do you realize, you know, today, and I don't know, maybe it's different in Alaska, but today, smoking, total faux pas. Right? Hey, you're going to, some of you need to get a dictionary look that up. Um, <laughs> oh, you're going to smoke? You have to go outside to the smoker's section. It's like the leper's calling, right? <laughs> you know, you're outside, unclean, unclean. <laughs> And how in the world, now I'm just going to completely step away and go right onto my soapbox here. How do we ever go to vaping? You've got to be absolutely kidding me. You look like you're sucking on a USB stick. <laughs> Stop that. Stop that. It's like smoking wasn't bad enough, so we wanted to create something far worse for your lungs. We came up with that. Stop that. Don't do I love you in Jesus' name. Stop that. <laughs> Anyways, the next time, if you're ever in near somebody, you're going to think, oh, that's a USB stick. Okay. <laughs> All right. Get that off the computer there. <laughs> Jesus is never changing. God is never changing. And he said, in me, you have peace. Successfully dealing with change has more to do, and please hear this because it's central, Successfully dealing with change has more to do with where we're centered in life than it does about what part of life we're in right. or what changes yeah. we're doing. Right? Uh, if I'm if I'm centered, if you will, in the world, you already know I'm just gonna experience tribulation. Right? I'm gonna I'm not gonna handle change well. I'm gonna if I'm, now listen, if I'm centered in myself, in my opinions, in my point of view, in my perspective, in my feelings, I'm going to experience the same tribulation, tribulation and turbulence because I'm ever changing. How many have ever felt one way about something and then later changed your mind? Would you raise your hand about that? How many have foods that you once hated that you now enjoy? Would you raise your hand? Like, that's all of us. That's all of us. Uh, although I think I'm kind of always like that. 
which I'm sure is horribly toxic. And like, it's probably worse than vaping, and I'm just living a hypocritical life. <laughs> I was about to say something like hypocritical. Hippoc <laughs> um, we keep blaming change for ruining our lives. But the truth is, the change that we despise, others welcome. So if change was truly the culprit for destroying our lives, how is it helping other people? Think about that. Well, my parents this, and so I've, yeah, but other people were thankful that happened. So you can't blame change and find that it's consistently the problem. Rather, it's where we're centered as we go through change in life. And remember, that's why I started by saying, life has always changed. Life has always changed. Uh, if you're going through the changes of life in the world, you're going to experience tribulation. All your suffering is going to point to the source of sin. All of your suffering, all of your hurt, all of, all of that, you go back to the source and it's sin. That's why you, can, you say, yes, yes, technology has allowed access to sin like never before. Totally acknowledge that. But man, I have grandparents, right, who were just living some cray-cray lives. And they didn't have all that. Why? Because sin was still present. Sin was still present. In the world, you'll have tribulation. Peace, I love this, peace is never changing with God. Meaning one day I have peace with God, and the next day God took it away. God's peace is as consistent as God is. Right? Uh, and that's why and when God's peace is manifested um, amid tribulation and turbulence, it just shines like that light that he talks about. It produces things that doesn't make any sense, like Paul and Silas in prison singing at midnight. Like, if I'm in that jail, I'm just like, oh, great, they brought the drunks in. Yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, why, why would you be singing in jail? Uh, I think about Joseph, who, you know, the butler and the baker offend, you know, Pharaoh, and so he ships him down there. He didn't know what he's going to do just yet. <laughs> they have these dreams, and they're all troubled. Joseph comes by. You know Joseph, right? Uh, his messed up life. Joseph comes by. What does he say? Hey, your countenance, your countenance is falling. What's wrong? Yeah, if I'm Joseph, I'm like, oh, you think you got problems? <laughs> Let me tell you about my life. Right? No, he still cared about other people. How can you be in a dungeon for something you did not do? Right? Come on. Yeah, yeah. And you got there from something you did not do wrong. Yeah. Like, you've been doing right the whole time, been delivered wrong the whole time, and you're in this place, and now you're still caring about other people. How do you even get to a place like that? Good, yeah. And please hear this. You decided, just like Joseph did, you decided to give change to God. If you and I try to sort it all out, figure it all out, we're going to live a frustrated life and confusing life. you got to take change and you got to give it to God. you got to give it to God. And I'll talk about that a little bit more, about what that looks like. But because Christ is never changing, his peace is always present. Remember, we're not trying to earn God's love in our relationship with him. But we are accessing the peace that he has promised through our relationship. That's why I don't want to get into the wrong kind of friends, the wrong kind of entertainment. I don't want to get into that because those things will drag me away from the love and the peace that God has for me. I'm not earning it by doing good things. I'm simply protecting it and accessing it. I have a wonderful marriage. If I go out to singles, bars, and all this kind of stuff, I don't know what people use it. And uh, you know, I'm out there and I'm you know fishing around and stuff. You know what? I'm hurting the relationship that I have. I haven't earned the relationship that I have, but I'm hurting it by my actions. You don't earn God's love. We talked about that yesterday. You have that, but... We're trying to stay connected with God's love. We're trying to stay connected with his peace. And we can do things that hurt us and pull us from that. It's not some kind of morality race. Because, now listen, because there are these two specific roads in life, there is these two roads. Give change to God 
trust him, handle it myself, try to figure it out with my friends, go the way of the world. There's the two main roads in life. Let me give you some verses here. Proverbs 16.25. Proverbs 16.25. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Hey, there are going to be times where it feels right to be angry about change. But remember, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man. Yeah. Like Joseph, we look at Joseph's life, we're like, man, this guy, right, he should have been permanently permascal. He should have been angry at the whole world every day he got up, but he wasn't. He handled change in a way that nobody else could. Because as you go back, when his brothers finally show up and he reveals, I'm Joseph, your brother, and they're like, ah! You know, and they should have been, because he was the second most powerful person in the world at the time. So he could have been like, oh, by the way, I'm going to have all you killed. Uh, he could have done that. But what did he say? Hey, don't be fearful. And he even says, don't be angry at yourself. Wow. Wow. Don't be angry at yourself. Why? God meant this for good. Joseph manifests and admits he had given change to God a long time ago. That's why he could be who he was in Potiphar's house. That's why he could be who he was in the prison. Because he gave change to God a long time ago. Let me ask you a question. How many of you are carrying something around you should have gave to God a long time ago? Yeah. How many of you are rebellious or bitter or angry, not because you truly in your heart of heart feel that way, but because all your friends think you should feel that way? Where are you at with change? There's two roads. Give it to God or carry it yourself. The wrong way always leads to the wrong destination. Proverbs 7, verse 24 through 7. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend unto the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths, for she has cast down many wounded gay. Many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. We're admonished in the scriptures not even to to go the way, not even to be near the, the house of the strange woman. We need to have we need to have the right expectations about how we handle change in our lives. We need to have the right expectations about how we handle change in our lives. Too many times we think that what we're doing is going to produce the right results. And, and let me be very specific about this, okay? Ladies, you grow up in a, in a difficult a home, dad's not really there. You don't have that sense of, of acceptance and approval from dad. And so off we are out into the world, subconsciously and or consciously seeking it from a guy, right? And you have this expectation that if I can just find a guy who will care about me, he'll help fill in the holes in my heart that dad left. That's a bad expectation. Right, right, That's right. a bad expectation. Um, and let me just give you a silly example. Uh, I, I'm a dog owner, and I think I'm a good dog owner because I have good dog expectations. <laughs> I, I, I'm a beautiful golden retriever named Zoe, and uh, I do not expect her to be my life's companion. I know there are people in the airport who have their companion, but no. Uh, <laughs> so it's not my... She's, that's not who God gave me the dog to be, right? It's not my expectation that Zoe cleans up the house. I wish she did. She doesn't clean up the house. She doesn't wash the car. She doesn't cook. I think her cooking would be awful. She does not cook. She doesn't do any of those things. And you know what, Brother David, it doesn't offend me at all because that's not my expectation. Do you know what her job is? This is her job, and she's really good at it. When I come home, she is super excited to see me. That is her job. That is her job. And she is the best at it. I'm telling you this. I'll be at the house, and sometimes I just got to go to the garage, which is connected to the house. And I'll go into the garage for a couple minutes, and I'll come back into the house, and she's just as excited to see me. And I'm like, you are a great dog. I really enjoy I know other people who own dogs. I don't think they like owning dogs. They want their dog to be a robot. They're always complaining about their dog. And I'm just thinking to myself, I don't think you want a dog, right? I think you know how dogs work. I'm never offended when my dog barks. Dogs bark. I have the right expectation. All of a sudden, we get the wrong expectation of how people should have this, and what they should have that, and how our parents should have this. And now we're all offended, and we're all angry inside, and we're all empty inside, thinking someone should have, but that was your expectation. You projected that onto them. 
And because of that, there'll always be a failure in your eyes. Uh, and you can't handle now. change. Instead of giving change to God and saying, God, you let it be that way. Right. You let it be that way. Yeah. Sad to me to see girls trying to fill their hearts with God, attention from God. Yeah. Yeah. You go, well, Brother Dan, if I correlate your illustration with guys, you're basically calling guys dogs. Talk to the older ladies who are married. They'll help you with that. There's, there might be a stronger correlation than you're aware of. By the way, girls, don't pick on our guys either. Don't don't play that game. Are you? And I don't. I'm I'm not the youth director. I don't know the youth director. I know mine for years. Our girls were always you just bagging on our poor guys. You know, our guys. Are, there's no cute guys in our youth group. They're all ugly and lame and blah 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 blah. All this stuff. Till one day, <laughs> we went to this, it was like a camp or a conference. Yeah, I know you guys go to other conferences and stuff, so I don't know if this happens to you or not. But we go to this other conference where there's these other youth groups and these other girls who don't know our guys. Right? Oh, no. And these other girls are like, hey. <laughs> the meat market is open. <laughs> who is this? Hold on. And then all our girls who are always bagging on our guys are like, oh, excuse me? <laughs> I'm like, whoa. Hold on, girl. I thought these were losers and you would be happy to be rid of them. Now you're all just like, you need to stay away. <laughs> I know, you're still trying to figure it out. <laughs> Don't, listen to me. Don't determine your expectation of change before it comes. Because you don't know how you'll actually feel when it comes. So, my wife and I had, had uh, sold our one house, and we were kind of in between houses at the time. You know, we were living in a tent on the street. Anyway, I was there. And uh, there's, a, there's a house, uh, and uh, a total band and some others have been there. There's this house on our, our church property, and the pastor said, well, somebody just moved out of there. Why don't you guys stay, stay in there? And it's got a big shop, but the house itself, I think, is, like the main house, I think, is like 782 square foot, something like that. That's like a large, really large, nice hotel room. You know? And it's, you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, we, we had, they came over, we had lunch in my living room. Because, like, the kitchen <laughs> kitchenette is not big enough for everybody. And uh, anyway, when we moved in, it was like, well, you know, at least we got a place to stay for a while, you know. But, but obviously, we're not going to live here. The place is tiny. Or why would you want to live here? And it's right on the church property. And everybody's already told me. People are banging on your door when they need stuff and all this kind of stuff. I just bought that house. I love I love living in that house. I, I'm so happy. Before I lived in it, I thought I knew how I would feel about it. But now that I, I've actually spent time in it, I bought it. I love it. You think you know. Right. Oh, if, if I just had this, if this guy gave me attention and we were together, I'd be so happy. You know, you think you would. Right. Come on, yeah. I promise you don't know. Again, talk to the married ladies. Yeah. <laughs> Not more than a week, too. Talk to the ones that have been here for a while. <laughs> Guys, oh, boy. If this cute girl would talk to me, we just hung out. If I could just this, if I could just that, then I finally feel. No, you think that, but you don't right, know that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And all of a sudden, we're running through life trying to create and manage change on our own because we know how it should all work out. No, you don't. You got to give that to God. You got to give that to God. God wants you to be single, be single. God wants you to be married, He'll tell you and show you when to get married. I'm tired of young people running around claiming. Oh, he's the God of my salvation. He secured my eternity, but I gotta go find somebody on my own. Mm. And your God just shrunk up in a big, big hurry. I I'm trying to help you with this. Come on now. Yeah. If it's not time for you to be married, you do not, 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 couple more not, 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 not want to be married. Yeah, that's right. Because what you think will be daily bliss, you will find out is daily torture. Yeah. Right? And I'm not going to go back to Samson and pick on Delilah. But anyway, um, it's kind of thing. Isaiah, can I give a couple references here? Isaiah 46.10. Isaiah 46.10. The Bible says this about God. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet. Our God knows how everything will work out and how everything will affect you. God knows all of it ahead of time. 
Revelation 1 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. If you feel God is leading you into something, know that what he's leading to you, you into, he already knows ahead of time right. it's best for you. Right. He already knows. He knows how. And he may lead you into a house that seems a lot smaller, but yet you're going to love it. Right? He's going to lead you into new friendships. He's going to do all these things. You've got to trust the Lord. You've got to give that change to God. Now, we have the power, now listen to this, we have the power to incite change, but we do not have power to control its outcome. We have power with our decisions to incite or create change, but we do not have the power to control its outcome. Let me give you an example of this. My mom comes to me and says, Dan, I want you to go ahead and do the dishes. I'm pretending I'm a teenager, because uh, I'm definitely thinking like one. Dan, I want to do the dishes. I'm going to create change in my home. And instead of saying, yes, ma'am, I'm going to decide to say, no. I have the power to do that. You guys act like, oh, trying to control me. No, you still have power over yourself. You do what you want, whether you feel like it or not. And I could have told my mom, no. Now, what I don't have power over is how many times she'll hit me with a frying pan. <laughs> I do not have that power, right? You can decide, you can decide to get involved in sin. You don't get to decide how addicted you become. Right, right, right. You don't get to decide how many people get hurt, how many other people you drag down, and how much of your own future and reputation you damage. You don't get that power. You just got the power to make the decision for change. But on the flip side of the coin, and I love this, God has the power to control all three types of changes. God has the power over the outcome. We don't. We can't even predict it. God, Romans 8.28, that he works all things together for good. He didn't say all things were good. Right. But he says he has the power to work all things together for good. You know God can take your broken life and work it out for good. Right. God has the power over the outcome. Amen. Somebody came into your life and hurt you. God can take that and do something good with it. God can do that. You've got, listen to me, young people, you've got to give change to God. you got to give change to God. If you hold on to it, likely it'll bitter you, it'll poison you, it'll turn you. you got to give it to God and say, I know God can use this. I know God wasn't necessarily for it, but God can use it. God can grow it. God can build something in my life. Joseph gave God change when his brother sold him into slavery. Joseph gave God change when Potiphar's wife lied about him, that horrible woman. Joseph gave God change when he was sentenced to prison. And I'll tell you this. Joseph gave God change when the guys that he had helped to interpret their vision, the one of them, the other one was no more, <laughs> the butler, he forgot Joseph for two years. And I don't know if Joseph put any hope and maybe this guy's going to go talk to Pharaoh and we're going to iron some of this stuff out and he'll stop living in slavery and stop living in a dungeon. He got forgotten for two years. But he gave it to God. And one day, according to God's watch, right. not yeah. ours, you throw your watch away, pick up God's watch. I need to have a relationship right now. No, you don't. Not if it's on God's watch, you don't. Know. And on God's watch, standing in the presence of one of the most powerful people in the world, the butler went, oh, my soul, I completely forgot. Pharaoh, I've sinned. There's a guy in the dungeon who can interpret dreams. And Joseph's life entered another realm of change. And now listen to this. Becoming, going from the dungeon to the second most powerful man in the land, Joseph, that would poison most people, but Joseph could handle it because he had already been learning how to deal with change through his life. And instead of poisoning him, he became a powerful, wise man because he had already been giving God the change. How are you going to handle it? Now listen, I'm not trying to be dark. 
I, I'm not here to pressure emotional buttons to get a response. That's manipulation, and I think it dishonors the Holy Spirit right. if I'm relying on that. My wife and I were talking and praying about that on the way here. There's a lady connected to our church who just lost her sweet baby. When that statistic, I'm trying to be dark, but statistically, this room will not be exempt from that type of thing. If you can't give God change now, how in the world are yeah, you going to survive that? Right. Yeah. We, we, change comes and we don't deal with it correctly. And so we keep reliving it over and over and over. You, listen to me, if someone's change, if their decision, if their abuse came in and affected your life and changed your life, I'm sorry for that. You're not wrong for them being a horrible person or sinning at that time. But listen to me, you do have the power to decide how long you let that go on in your own life. Yeah. And you got to say that we're done. Right. I was exposed to some things in my younger years that I had to make a decision at some point and say, this isn't going to live on in my family. Nah. I'm the firewall. Right. It's going to stop with me. Good. Some of you, well, Good. my mom and dad, they freak out and they start yelling at me. Yeah, what you don't realize is their parents physically abuse them. Yeah. And they're deciding, hey, that stops with me. Now, they don't like losing their temper. They still have to answer to God for that. But they're trying to be a firewall from what they went through. Yes, you're right. Yes. I heard about one boy, a famous person. Uh, his dad loved boxing. And his son wasn't a, a, a boxer. His son was more of the creative, you know, I want to paint something. I want to play music. But his dad put him from the time he was a little, little boy, his dad put him in boxing. He was a teenager. He went home one day, and his dad was watching boxing. His dad was like an old coal miner or something. He told his dad, he said, Dad, I really don't want to box. His dad grabbed the, the antenna off the TV and beat his son. Sometimes you and I have to stand up and say, it's the change, the bad change stops with me. It stops with me. I'm not going to carry it on. If you were abused, there's a good chance you'll abuse others. If you grow up in an alcoholic's home, there's a good chance you're going to have an alcoholic's home. Statistically speaking, but when we take change and give it to God and say, no, my kids won't even know what alcohol smells like. My kids won't know what it looks like to have dad hit mom. They're not going to grow up like that. It's going to be different. My kids aren't going to wonder who their real parents are. They're going to know I'm their real parent. It's going to change with me. But if you're going to get there, you got to give change to God. you got to give change to God. Now let me close. I'm going to give you one last thing. Don't assume... Don't assume that people can never change. Don't assume that people can never change. <laughs> you work in youth ministry, and guys, you know I love you, right? Because there you're like, oh, no. <laughs> Brother Dave, Brother Dave knows exactly what I'm talking about, some of the workers. We'll have, as a youth leader, we'll have 13 year old boys walk through the door, and it's like, <laughs> Dear Jesus, <laughs> we're going to need some help. <laughs> right? They don't know how to tie their shoes, oh, no. take a shower, uh, not blurt out their thoughts every five seconds. <laughs> and by the time they're ready to graduate, we're getting teary. I go, man, I'm going to hate to see that one leave. Yeah. Oh, no. I'm going to hate to see that one leave. And you go, whoa, you don't hate to see all of them? I gotta be honest. <laughs> <laughs> gotta be honest. I'm preaching here. Be honest. <laughs> Some of you have stopped believing that you can change for that. Now I'm just gonna climb right up into your head. There are girls sitting here that within a week of today, when you look in the mirror and you see yourself, you just get a yucky feeling.
If it's something you can change, change it. Yeah. And if you can't, God made it. Right. Yeah. And you need to pick change up and give it to God and say, God, I'm going to glorify you if you have made me that. Yeah. Yeah. And Brother Stephen talked about this. Oh, I wish I was like her. She's so pretty. She probably thinks she's ugly. Yeah. Right? God help our girls stop trying to find validation externally. Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I joke with our guys, but I always try to be a real positive enforcer for our guys. And there was a there was a there was a season I didn't plan it, but there was a season where some of our guys just got into this thing about wearing suits and dressing sharp. I don't know how the fire started, but man, I was fanning the flames. I loved it. We literally had guys, we had some guys go, I think it started with some of our guys had gone to our pastor and said, Pastor, we don't know how to pick out ties and everything. And he gathered them up. He's like, let's go. Bought them all suits. Not talk, took them down to the local place. I don't, I don't think there is a place like that up here, but took them down and, and bought them all suits. Bought them all Carhartts or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> took them down and bought them all suits. I mean, we had guys coming to church like Brother Dave. They were out dressing me, man. I was like, oh, I gotta start stepping up my game. <laughs> it's Wednesday night. I got guys making me look like I'm homeless here, you know. And, and uh, I was, man, I was complimenting our guys. I'm like, man, you're looking sharp, and I'm, I'm so proud of you. I'm, you know, appreciate the way you're dressing. It's not requirement. You know, it's what's in your heart that we care about. But man, praise God for you know the, the dressing sharp. And they weren't trying to outdress, you know, kids who didn't have clothes like that. It wasn't a pride thing. They were just trying to be their best and you know really improve they were. They hit that. 15, 16, kind of turning the corner there and stepping up. I really love that. Had a couple of our girls, I think I might have told this before, had a couple of our girls come to us and say, came to me and said, Brother Dan, and I was like, well, yeah. And they said, you know, you're always bragging on the guys and how they look, and you never seem to brag on the girls about how we look. <laughs> <laughs> I got the biggest, goofiest girl in my face, and I was like, oh. <laughs> and they were like, oh. <laughs> You know, the wheels are turning, and I was like, you girls look so pretty. And they're like, no! Stop, stop, stop! Stop, stop, stop! Stop, stop, stop! Girls, you can't get your, you can't get your validation externally. Yeah, that's right. Wow. What do I do? Show up? Oh, you look so pretty. And I like lifted my eyes as I said that. <laughs> so pretty. You know, let's not have him back at camp. Or let's get a background check on that one. <laughs> you can't, you can't get that. It's not. And by the way, here's the truth: if you have already determined that you're ugly, my words won't penetrate the wall you have built in your own heart. Right. And this is what this is what honestly just stirs up anger in me. A lot of girls think that because somebody else told you that. Or you derived it from some off-the-wall comment they made. Well, they said she's pretty and I don't look like her, so therefore I'm ugly. Listen, you got to let that go and give that to God. I got guys who act dumb because they think they're dumb. Because when they were a kid, somebody said they were dumb. Somebody made a joke. The workers laughed at it, and you felt like that was validation why you can't honestly process five good thoughts in your brain. That's nonsense. Yeah. Right. I was a horrible student growing up. It was not for my teacher. I hated school. School hated me. We did not get along. Right? So finally, I'm in some of my later high school years, and I got to go take the ACT. More commonly, it's the SAT these days that people are taking, but... I went to take my ACT, kind of get scored. I don't know how to describe this. I was a meathead. <laughs> and uh, so the night before, the test was just more school to me. So the night before the test, it's Friday night, I just stay up late yeah. watching TV, playing video games, and I mean late. Like can't late. <laughs> so the next morning, I wake up a zombie. And I'm like, not literal for some of you. And I go off to this community college where they're hosting this test. Oh my word. I struggled on that test so bad. And, oh, they, they're like, okay, uh, re reading and comprehension, you have 45 minutes to read this section and answer the following questions. And I'm like, 
The next thing I remember hearing is, you have five minutes to complete this section. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> I don't know if you know the ACT, it's multiple choice. I'm like, I got a shot. I start filling stuff in. Does anybody want to guess what my test results were? Yeah. They wanted to issue me a bike helmet. Right. They were not happy with Brother Dan. I, but I'll tell you this, because of my grades in school and because of that, now I never told anybody this, I just felt like, I'm a dumb person. Now, I wasn't down on myself, and I didn't walk around my shoulders, but I never really tried to learn anything. I never really tried to develop myself because I already knew I'm not really good at that. Nobody told me that. I told that to myself. I Listen, I stopped believing I could change. I stopped believing I could grow because I wasn't looking at what God could do in me. I was looking at what I thought I could do in me. Some of you are stuck, and truth be known, the person who built the box you're in is you. Is you. And you got to tear that thing down and say, I'm giving this to God. I'm going to believe God can change me to be better than I am and who I am and what I am. And, and ladies, I'm just going to come over here for a little bit. we got to get off the beauty kit. Seriously. I know that there's people out there trying to make everybody feel good about how they look and all that other stuff. And I'm not a member of their club per se, but listen to me. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Right. And there's a reality to that. Yeah. And if you follow God, God is going to bring some guy who is not the answer to your problems. Oh, I've got a whole message there. <laughs> and you, and how you look, and how you walk, and how you talk, is going to be what that man has been looking for all his life. Yeah. And you won't have to change a single thing. Right. But if you keep following the world's philosophy saying, I have to transform who I am to be something I'm not, so someone I don't care about will desire me, that's insane. Right. What you need to do is just be the best you. Right? That's all you got to do. And all of a sudden, you see other girls, and they got this relationship and that relationship, and you're starting to validate or unvalidate yourself based on other people. That's nonsense. Yeah. You don't like being alone? Rejoice that they're not. It will come, and it's time. We, I know very, very, very few single adults, and the ones I know are really single on purpose. That is the nicest way I can possibly say <laughs> <laughs> oh. Everybody acts like... Only in America, go study the world statistics, only in America do we marry so young. We put so much pressure on our young people that you're 20, you're out of the house, you got to get hitched. Go study the rest of the world. I get married until they're in their 30s and 40s. Now, I'm not saying their marital pattern is wonderful, by the way. <laughs> Trying to help you. we got to start believing that God can do a work in us so that he can do a work through us. By the way, let me finish that story and I'll, I'll close up. I got out of high school. Um, I had to pay some teachers off like the cabin people. <laughs> I was going to work really hard. My second senior year, that's not a bragging point. My second senior year, I had to do a year and a half worth of work to graduate. But you're like, oh wow, you were a kid. You did hate school. <laughs> Then I was going, I was going, I was getting into a community college, and they said, "Well, we got to give you a placement test, and it's the, it's the equivalent. Their placement test would be the equivalent to the ACT." And they told me that I was like, "Oh, I, oh, oh I've seen this one coming. I know that of the test. I did things different this time. I went out because I'm technical. I didn't go buy a book. I went and got some software specifically designed to teach you not only to refresh some of the basics you learned in school, but also teach you." how to approach an ACT test. Man, I went in there, I felt like the smartest person in the room. I'm not kidding. We're on computers, I was getting stuff done, I'm looking up, I'm like, other kids are sweating, and <laughs> but I'm just like, man, this is easy. Because I've prepared for it. Yeah. Do you know what, in that day, it dawned on me, I guess I'm not dumb. Wow. I guess I'm not dumb. Yeah. But I had limited myself for years because I had been telling myself that. Let me ask you a question. What are you telling yourself? Are you telling yourself something God's not telling you? Right. You're going to get in the wrong relationship 
not because you want it, because you've been telling yourself you're not this, you're not that for so long, and so you gotta settle. Every person in this room right now can have a relationship if you want it, if you're willing to settle low enough. But that's not why we do that. We need to take change, whether it's in our lives, whether it's something that's happened to us, whether it's our future that we're nervous about, whatever it is, we need to take that change and say, God, I'm gonna give this change to you. I wanna believe you to help change me and guide me that you would do all of that. If we give change to God, even though we're in a world full of tribulation, we'll have peace. We'll have peace. We'll have peace. Change is inevitable. It is constant. <coughs> but it doesn't have to be detrimental, depending on how you decide to handle it. Let's pray together. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for this time. And I know that it's been a uh, bit of a serious time. I know we've gotten in and kind of rummaged around in people's hearts and different things. And what I just pray in this moment, not a big invitation, but I just pray in this moment that you would help the message, the word, to land in the hearts and the minds where it needs to land. Father, you know my heart. I just fear for so many of our young ladies how they just get into this place where they start telling themselves things. And all of a sudden, that changes the course of their own future. I pray you'd help them. The Holy Spirit, even now, you minister to them and help them to find where they need to be. I pray for our young men. Where they get it, suffer an identity crisis, spend their, spend their adolescence trying to prove themselves or hide from themselves. And what they really need is the peace that only comes from God. I pray you'd help us. Help us to stop judging other people and putting other people down. Help us to, help us to believe, hey... Even, even the kid who still has some maturing to do in the youth group, God can make that change. God can help them change. We're going to help them too. We're going to support what God's doing in their life. Help us to believe that other people can still change. Father, thank you so much for what you've already done at camp. I'm, I'm so appreciative. Father, thank you for our workers. Thank you for Brother Dave and his wife and all that they put into this place. Thank you for all the parents back home who've been praying and supporting. And Father, by your spirit, and I pray, Father, you know this in my heart. You know this in my heart. I'm praying all the way out here, Father, that you would use this lesson and, and touch the hearts that needed to be touched this afternoon. I, I know that there's some here. Father, please help them. Please help them. Do what only you can do by your Holy Spirit. We love you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Mother Change. It's the only thing in your life that's constant.